Okay, take it away. Okay, so remember, the, the key is not what you know, but your ability to c communicate it in an understandable manner. And so that, and so what we're going to do in these slides is show you how to communicate stuff in an understandable manner. Next slide. Okay. All right. And what you tell the client very simply is with a properly structured charitable giving technique, it might not cost you anything because what you are giving to the charity is the money you would otherwise have paid in federal and state income taxes or estate taxes. So if you if you have an asset with a million dollars and you sell it and you have two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of taxes to pay in the game, you're going to net seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So how how would you like to say instead of giving that two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to the uh, tax authorities, how would you like to give it to the charity of your choice? And of course, they say, if I, as long as I have to pay 250, give it to the charity instead of the IRS. And that's the key to communicating charitable giving. All right, so let's go into the first example I have. Where is it? Let's go to a very simple example. Okay. Uh, no, go on, skip this one. We can, we don't need to. This is just communication. A lot of individuals of modest means frequently have large charitable bequests in their will. So for example, Mr. and Mrs. Senior that are 71 and 69, and they have 6 million of investment assets generating a nice 5% rate of return. And they that is, besides their retirement plan, the other 300,000 is basically going to be used to fund their retirement. And so they can't afford to really give any of that $6 million away while they're alive because they need all 300,000 for their retirement, okay? But they say, when, when my surviving spouse passes away, I have a charitable bequest of a million dollars because when both of us are gone, we don't need the income anymore. So the bottom problem is when you have a charitable bequest in your will, there's no income tax deduction because basically the bequest is by the estate and the estate gets an estate tax deduction, but no income tax deduction. So here is the solution, okay? We want the individual to retain the right to all 300,000 of income. And they, want, and they also want to give a million dollars to charity at their death. So they put the million dollars into a charitable remainder trust with the million dollar income producing asset that's generating 5% or $50,000 a year. Now in the charitable remainder trust, what this means is they have a right to receive and will receive $50,000 a year for the rest of their life. And when they die, the million dollars will go to the charity. So the client says, wait a minute, I still have all the income from the 6 million, but part of it is gonna come from the charitable remainder trust. That sounds good, but what's the advantage of that? Well, the advantage is very simple because you get a charitable income tax deduction for the present value of the right that the charity received that $1 million when you pass away. And so what you're telling the client is there's a $400,000 charitable income tax deduction that doesn't cost you anything. So why give it as a bequest in your will when you can give it as a donation in a charitable remainder trust? Alan, any comments there? Yes, you can either do this as a charitable remainder annuity trust where you get 50,000 a year exactly for life, or with the unit trust, you're gonna get 5% of the value of whatever it grows to. So if it doubles to 2 million in 15 years, then you're gonna be getting 100,000 a year. So it can help keep up with inflation. And you could even make it a little fancier and delay taking your 5% payments to delay paying the tax on the 5% payments until you need it 
in a later year. So, so the, you key, do the key is for those individuals of modest means who have charitable bequests in their will, you can accomplish the same purpose and generate a charitable income tax deduction that you otherwise would not have gotten. Very simple. And the charity at the end can be whoever you decide at that time or, and can be a family foundation to be formed on your death so that your children can operate it and even receive compensation for ser charitable services they actually render. Yeah. And most, but this is designed for people who cannot afford to give money to charity while they're alive because they need the income from it. So it's a wonderful income tax planning technique even though they're not subject to estate taxes. Right, and, and we've had clients with a $200,000 net worth that just really wanted to give $25,000 to the library, retired school teachers are an example. And, and this actually protects those assets from creditor claims, protects them from children taking the assets away from them. Under Florida law, this can be an annuity trust so that creditors can't take the annual payment. So there are advantages, but the disadvantage is you can't get into the principal. You just get your 5% or whatever percentage you chose a year. If you need a lung transplant, you can't reach into the trust. But it's a, it's a great it's a great technique for what I call people who cannot afford to give large amounts to charity while they're alive. Right, right. All right, All right. now here, here's what's interesting is the your charitable income tax deduction for a charitable major trust is based on the mortality tables that the IRS is required to use. For example, a person age 70 has a life expectancy under the IRS mortality tables that the IRS is required to use of 14 years. So if they put that million dollars into the charitable remainder trust, retaining the right to the 50,000 a year for the rest of their life, it is assumed that they're going to die 14 years from now. Well, here's the problem is, okay, and so the charitable deduction is based on the fact that the charity is gonna get it at what is their life expectancy. In other words, under the mortality tables, the IRS is required to use an individual age 70 has a life expectancy of exactly 14 years. So the charitable deduction is based on the present value of the right to receive that million dollars 14 years from now. Okay. So here's the problem, or here's the advantage of this. Go to the next slide. The mortality tables that the IRS is currently used is based on the year 2000 census data of the US population as a whole. Over the past 22 years, life expectancy has increased. And if you look at the 2010 census data, the life expectancy of someone age 70 is not 14 years, but is 16 years. So what, and these mortality tables are based on the US population as a whole. And our donors have access to much better health care and are much, and basically you can go to an insurance company for a healthy 70 year old and they will say, age 70, we expect you to live another 20 years to age 90. So essentially, based on your health and your uh, and everything, and by the way, 14 years as a life expectancy means 50% of the people who are age 70 will have passed away and 50% will still be alive. So the point is, if you are funding a charitable remainder trust, they're going to compute the remainder interest based on the 2000 census data at 14 years. In reality, the chair, if you live to age 90, which is not unusual in today's environment, you're gonna live 20 years. So you're getting 
a charitable deduction on the assumption that charity is going to get the property in 14 years, when in reality, the charity is going to get the property in 20 years. So your charitable deduction for the remainder interest is overvalued. So you're getting income, not for 14 years, but for 20 years. So you might as well take, and by the way, uh, you might as well take advantage of this because you get a larger charitable deduction. Now, here's the problem is the new, next slide. Okay, the, I, the Center of Disease Control finally last year sent the IRS the updated 2010 mortality tables. The IRS issued proposed regs adopting the 2010 mortality tables, which will become effective sometime by the end of the year. So, but now, as soon as these new mortality tables become effective, you're still entitled to use the 2000 mortality tables. So if someone is thinking about this, tell them to do it now because they're going to get a larger charitable income tax deduction if they do it now than when the new tables are implemented. But don't worry, the new tables are still based on the 2010 census data. So they're still going to be 12 years out of date and they're still based on the entire U.S. population. So you might, you might as well take advantage of the increased charitable deduction you get with a charitable remainder trust. And, and especially if your client is not a smoker, not obese, because the standard tables take into account all the smokers in the United States, all the obese folks in the United States, drinkers, et cetera. So when you talk to your clients and their parents made it to age 95 and your clients in their, is age 70, there's a good chance they're going to make it to age 95. All right. So essentially, this is, this is simple stuff, okay? Now, here is something interesting. There are a lot of individuals who have funded charitable remainder trusts while they're alive. And, you know, they listened to Alan and said, hey, I remember I listened to your Saturday session. Instead of going to Temple on Saturday, I listened to your session. You know, so I'll have to do my prayers at home or something, whatever. And I set up this nice charitable remainder trust. And it's, and basically I put in a, oh, by, by the way, Alan, question. What is my favorite college football team? Michigan. No, it's who's ever playing Ohio State. <laughs> Where did I go to school? <laughs> All right. Just a little tidbit there. I like okay. that. I didn't know that answer. All right. So essentially, I, I, I did this charitable remainder trust, and it's, a, it's paying me $60,000 a year of bond interest. So that means I'm getting $60,000 a year of interest income that I have to pay income taxes on. And if I have... So basically, what I will net, at, and let's just, and by the way, why am I a, in a big fan of raising the maximum income tax rate from 30%, 37% to 40%? Makes the calculations easier? Yeah, it's, easy, it's easier to do the math in your head. Right. <laughs> so basically, I know that I'm going to get, thir after taxes for the rest of my life, I'm going to get. $36,000 a year. Interestingly, I also have say, you know, I've been getting the money, but I'd like to get the money to the charity today instead of waiting another 20 years until I die. Okay. And you can do that because if you terminate the charitable remainder trust early, the million dollars is allocated between the charity and you. In other words, the charity is getting an amount equal to the present value of its remainder interest, and you get the rest. So let's look at the next slide. Okay. So if you terminate the charitable remainder trust early, the IRS has a formula in the statute 
which tells you exactly how to allocate that million dollars between the charity and you. And because of, of this, remember the discount rate for the remainder interest in a high interest rate environment is very high, which means the value of your retained interest will be what's left. And under the IRS's formula, the present value of your right to the income is $613,000. But it's, but remember the million dollars is a bond with a million dollar basis. So you can allocate $613,000 to that early distribution payment. So when you get the 613 and you have a 613 basis, there's no gain. Well, wait a minute. Using that same discount rate, the present value for the next 20 years of the 36,000 after tax for the next 20 years is $498,000. But if you terminate it early, you're getting 613. What would you rather have, 613 or 498? I'll go with 613. Okay. So you and so, but notice. I didn't go through the technicalities. I just said, what would you rather have? 613,000 or 498,000? Only give the consumer two choices. Right. So, and this is just, so basically when you have individuals who have these existing charitable remainder trusts and you say, how would you like to have a significant income tax advantage, get more money and give the charity the present value of the million dollars today rather than waiting 20 years. And Jerry, do you have a white paper on this? Was this what we wrote up for Notre Dame a couple of years ago? It's still a draft. Okay, well, if anyone would like to see a draft white paper on this, just send us an email that says draft white paper. Well, actually, interestingly enough, uh, I have uh, this draft. I've had, when classes end August 18, and I have my final exam, all I have to do is grade final exams. Wow. <laughs> and, and then, uh, and then basically, uh, uh, I'm going to work on that as a paper because a lot of people aren't aware of this very simple, the simple technique. Yeah, I'm definitely want to know more about it. Yeah. Okay, Jerry, any any final words before we go to the Notre Dame? Yeah, what's the next one? Oh, let me see where we were. I don't know where, all right. Uh, there, is, there, there is a situation which you're not gonna go into, uh, but um, oh, th this, is a, an, a, this is another practical situation. There's an individual who's retired, they sold it, he sold his house, he moved into an independent living facility, and so he has no more itemized deductions, no more mortgage interest, no property taxes. And, you know, Fred is a single taxpayer. His gross income is 210, and he's always given $10,000 a year to charity. But now his itemized deductions no longer are significant, so he takes the $12,000 standard deduction. So he, all he gets is a $300 deduction for the $10,000 he contributes to the charity and he still takes the standard deduction. So basically he has taxable income of 198 and has to pay income taxes on the 198. What I'm showing you is if he puts an income producing asset into a trust, okay? And ba basically, the trust is its own separate taxpayer. So he puts an income producing asset into the trust that generates $10,000 of income. The trust is a separate taxpayer. The trust reports 10,000 of income, gets a $10,000 deduction, and he can still use the standard deduction. And that's what the little example is designed to do. Again, this is for people who are not subject to a state tax and the, of people of modest means. Now I define a person of modest means as under $12 million. 
So, so Jerry, let me ask you on this trust, if Fred is a beneficiary of this trust, then it's going to be disregarded for income tax purposes unless it's a Ning. So this would be a trust for charity and his children and grandchildren? It's just basically, if, if, if you look at the money he needs for his living expenses. And the, uh, is that on the next slide? Let me see. No. No, it's not. If you look at the money he needs for living expenses, he doesn't really need the income that the hundred, he, the, he doesn't really, the, all he needed was the income from the hundred thousand, uh, from the money he put into the trust. Okay. So he, in other words, he, he's, he, he, the 250 that's going to generate the $10,000. He, that's what he's been giving the charity. He doesn't need that income. Okay, so he's not going to be a so he's not going to be a beneficiary. He can't get the two hundred and fifty back for himself, but he could get it to his. He doesn't children. need it because the right. two hundred and fifty gives the ten, generates the ten. He's going to give the charity. So what he does is he just makes a gift of the two hundred and fifty to a regular non grantor trust for the benefit of his children, and he gives the trust the ability while he's alive to give ten thousand dollars a year to charity. Okay, fantastic. All right. And then do you want to mention charitable gift annuities for a minute? Or do you want to go to the other gift annuities is a nice way of selling an asset to a charity for a, a, a deferred payment obligation, which is an annuity for the rest of your life. So what you're doing is with a charitable gift annuity is you're selling an appreciated asset, you're getting an annuity, which is a deferred payment obligation, and instead of reporting the entire gain up front, you're reporting the gain each year as you get the charitable annuity payment. So it's a nice transaction, and it also generates a charitable income tax deduction, but it's a nice transaction which allows you to defer the reporting of the gain of an asset that you intend to sell. Thank you everybody for attending this uh, presentation. Jerry, I hope you'll come back. You're always welcome any Saturday. I can apologize to your rabbi that you weren't there. Uh, questions, comments, and suggestions can be sent to Jerry, J Hesh, J H E S C H, 62644 at gmail.com or me, A Gasman at gasmanpa.com, and I'll pass it on to Jerry. And may the rest of your weekend be as, as nice, relaxing, or stimulating as, as it can be. Thank you very much. Good job, guys. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. <laughs> Take care. All right. Bye.